Well, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back to A House Divided, coming to you from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. My name is Bjorn Skaptison, and I am your administrator for today's interview. Uh, the book we are going to talk about today is Lincoln's Lie uh, by Elizabeth Mitchell. Now that's Lincoln's Lie, a true Civil War caper through fake news. <laughs> I love the all caps on the dust jacket. <laughs> Fake news, Wall Street and the White House. Uh, it comes to us from uh, Counterpoint Publishers and we thank them for publishing the book and putting us together with Elizabeth Mitchell who's going to discuss the book with us today. It costs $26 and it is available to you, like I said, in I don't know if I said, but it's available to you in first edition. The first printings are here. And Elizabeth Mitchell, the author, has generously signed a custom Abraham Lincoln Bookshop book plate that we are going to send to you with your book. If you wish to order the book during the course of this interview, you're watching it streaming to you on Facebook. If you wish to order a copy of the book, I will put a link in the comments section. And so you can click right on through and you can order the book and we'll ship it to you. You can also, of course, do that after the program is over. If you wish to ask a question of Elizabeth Mitchell, uh, you can do that by leaving a question in the comments and I will, uh, I will review the comments and curate your questions and share them with Elizabeth Mitchell. I'll probably pop in at about the half hour point of our conversation. So that's all I have. That's all I have for us today. So I am going to introduce you to your host for this discussion, Daniel Weinberg of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, A House Divided. I'm in our usual studio that's embedded in our bookshop. Uh, and we wish Elizabeth was here with us. Vaccines are coming. So knock on wood, we'll have her for her next book here at the bookshop. Um, now, let me introduce who we have, and we're honored to have you, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth has worked as an investigative reporter and a features writer. Her freelance writing has appeared in such publications as the Wall Street Journal, New York Magazine, Chicago Tribune, Book Forum, Smithsonian, GQ, Oh, Glamour, The Nation, that's just some. At the New, New York Daily News, she served as a senior long form writer. She was executive editor of the political magazine, George. She has been interviewed on numerous radio and television shows. She's delivered lectures on journalism at Harvard University, Fairley Dickinson University and others. She taught nonfiction writing at Columbia University. She's a co-founder of Read This, a volunteer group that delivers books where needed to troops overseas, children living in poverty, in public schools with no library. Huh, either you're a Renaissance woman or you can't keep a job. <laughs> sure which one this is. So, you're the author of three nonfiction books Liberty's Torch, The Great Adventure to Build the Statue of Liberty, Three Strides Before the Wire, The Dark and Beautiful World of Horse Racing, and W, Revenge of the Bush Dynasty. She's authored novella-length nonfiction works, including The Real Story of the Statue of Liberty, The Fearless Mrs. Goodwin, about the first US female detective. Her latest book is, as Bjorn said, when you see in back of me, um, Lincoln's Lie, a true Civil War caper through fake news, Wall Street, and the White House. And as Bjorn said, counterpoint is the publisher, 288 pages and $26. And remember, you will get this signed book plate that uh, she's so graciously signed for us and uh, will come with that. Uh, actually, just a book question, Elizabeth, why are there no illustrations in this book? Was that your publisher's point of view? It was the publisher's decision. And, uh, you know, there was a moment where I thought, wait, what are we doing? But then I, I actually am okay with it in as much as I wanted it to have this kind of narrative drive. And there's something about having it look like 
a, you know, a, what we think of as, you know, maybe a novel or what have you that helps that experience so that you get to imagine the characters just, you know, the, the people in it based just on the descriptions that were provided by journalists of the day or things that I've been able to fill in. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> uh, a, a quick question about George, because I remember it well, and many of our listeners or viewers will. Uh, just very briefly, yeah. what was your experience at George? How did you get involved with John John, whom I remember being born, by the way? <laughs> and uh, how did you find him to be? Well, I was um, I was working over at Spin Magazine as a features editor, and I was headhunted to go over to George um, by William Vanden Heuvel, who had worked in the Bobby Kennedy administration. Um, and he uh, said, would you be interested in meeting John to talk to him about this new magazine he's starting? So I went over there as a senior editor, and about five months in, I was promoted to executive editor, and then I was, you know, served as the number two for him for, you know, I think it was three and a half, four years. And um, it was incredible. I mean, first of all, he was as lovely as people think he was. Um, he was just a wonderful friend as well as, you know, boss and all that. And his whole interest was in getting more people interested in politics and feeling like they could make good decisions. And so it was a postpartisan publication that looked at, you know, people across the political spectrum, but always with that idea, why do they believe what they believe? Are they effective? You know, um, what are their faults and foibles? And then, you know, it, letting people make their own decisions. So, uh, yeah, he was, I mean, he was fun. He was great. <laughs> well, we miss him positively. We miss uh, George and uh, thank you for being a part of it and helping us because I enjoy reading that magazine while it was still around. Yeah, thank and you. And something I wanted to say is that you really have a gift of painting word pictures of people. So maybe we don't need those illustrations. <laughs> also of places and events. And it's a wonderful historical narrative that will truly sweep you viewers, you readers along. We had uh, Ted Whitman here, who uh, I understand is a good friend of yours, and uh, his book was like that too. And I think the two of them vie for wonderful reading. So I, I think you. everyone should get this and Lincoln people should get this and you'll see why, because it's going to upend a few things with you and uh, we have to uh, contend with it. Let me ask you about your sources very quickly. What sure. are your best primary and secondary sources? Uh, and especially since newspapers of the day were so hyper-partisan. Yes. Uh, how did you separate fact from fiction? Well, first, first of all, I spent a fair amount of time at the Library of Congress and also at the National Archives looking at, you know, raw documents, letters between uh, various people who were involved in the story of this book, um, and, uh, you know, and also Civil War records in the National Archives. Um, I, you know, in terms of the historians that are out there, I think Michael Burlingame is basically, you know, uh, just an extraordinary contributor to, to our historical knowledge. So some of the things that he was able to um, on earth, particularly about the staff members of, uh, for uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, John Hay and Stoddard, et cetera. Um, those were very helpful to me as uh, primary, I mean, as secondary source material. Um, I always, uh, you know, I was looking at a lot of newspapers, but I was also cross-checking everything they said with documents that were kind of of the moment that might have been even, you know, records of things that were happening in New York City at the time using uh, archives here uh, and at the uh, New York Public Library. So it was a kind of combination of things and always kind of keeping in mind my reporter training, you know, that you have to have three sources for everything. <laughs> so that was uh, part of it as well. I certainly thought the investigative side of you uh, was in this book. You could <laughs> yeah. feel it. Uh, I'm a, a footnote person, mm -hmm. and uh, I go through them all the time. I have yeah. great fun with them. Yeah. Uh, but I want to ask you this, because after events longer, long ago involving Stephen Ambrose, Doris Kearns Goodwin, and Stephen Oates, historians have tended to use footnotes so liberally as sometimes they're a quarter of the darn book. Yeah. So as a journalist, which you, which you come from, 
And, but writing as an historian, what is your approach to this? How do you mix footnotes, the numbers of them, with acknowledgments and stated bibliography? Well, first of all, I over footnote to start with. I basically footnote everything as I'm working because I want to be able to go back and double check everything. Um, and also, uh, you know, and when you're doing a project like this, it becomes an incredible memory game, you know, where you're trying to, you know, recollect exactly which letter it was and, you know, which image on your, you know, hard drive and all that um, corresponds. So I over footnote. And then I think about it in terms of my own work, how many times I've gone to books and thought if I could only have, you know, the source where they got that information, I would be able to both examine it for veracity, but also, you know, it could lead me to other things. And so I, I tend to footnote for my colleagues, let's say, you know, the people who will come later, who will write histories about Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War or what have you, and they will want to know how I mapped it out. So that's what I do. And then when I realize it's getting almost nauseating <laughs> to have so many footnotes, I try to call some um, just out of courtesy to the reader. Hmm. Well, I mean, though, any of us, I said this uh, on a book not long ago that I've always wanted to interview an author only from the footnotes. I know. And, uh, you know, there are some good, good uh, books for that. Yeah. But, uh, nonetheless, I'm forced to read a book nonetheless. <laughs> but let's get into uh, some of the meat of this. Uh, first of all, Joseph Howard Jr. is mm -hmm. the main person here with uh, Mary Lincoln and Abraham also in here as prime uh, subjects. Um, and I, I want to start off, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Howard and his past, but let's put him on the inaugural train. Okay. I always have fun reading a book that references historical artifacts that I've handled uh, here in the shop. And so <laughs> one of them was Lincoln's letter to George McClellan, uh, you know, basically saying, what have you done with your horses that have made them so tired? Yes, yes. Uh, I handled that wow. some years ago. I wish I had it back. Yeah. Um, another was uh, on the train, and here is the train pass. That's amazing. Or what? You, and you give the uh, the typescript of this mm -hmm. in your book on page sixteen. You can read this because uh, Howard was on the inaugural train and got this from Wood. There is his signature. Oh, great! Right there. Yeah. And most people don't know that on the back is this anti-fraud piece that uh, they put on so that it could not be produced by someone else without, without that. That's so uh, as a journalist uh, for the New York Times under Henry Raymond, uh, how did Howard perceive Lincoln? Uh, he spoke some wonderful words on the train, uh, Lincoln did. And I don't know if I'm gonna get to that, but how did Howard view Lincoln during the train ride? Did they meet? And what did he have to say about it? Yes. The, I mean, they definitely met because he was an embedded, you know, what we consider an embedded reporter. So he managed to get on in Cincinnati and then take the train with Abraham Lincoln for the rest of the journey. So he was, you know, th there, as you know, there wasn't a whole lot of restriction on how the journalist could move in and out of Abraham Lincoln's car. So there's even a moment where Joseph Howard sees Lincoln snoozing in his car and, and notes that it's fantastic that he sleeps with his mouth closed because this is more fitting of a president. But he started off being just sort of curious about him. Um, you know, he certainly knew an awful lot about him because he had worked with, uh, you know, as the assistant to Reverend Henry Ward Beecher and Beecher had been so important to Lincoln in terms of the, um, some of the thinking leading up to his uh, candidacy. And so, uh, so he, he views him in this, you know, at the very beginning in a somewhat detached way, describing him in detail, you know, right down to, you know, the length of his back and things like that. Um, by the end of the trip, he's, he's fully convinced that Abraham Lincoln is an extraordinary man, that this is a very quick mind, um, you know, a, 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 a more decent human than he is, you know, coming in contact with. And yet, as you, you know, learn in the book, um, it doesn't prevent him from pulling a trick on Lincoln that actually does some real damage to his reputation. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a moment. Uh, 
what I wanted to just read was a couple of sentences, not with a question in mind, but just because I think it should be read right now. Uh, Lincoln noted how in a, in a public remarks, uh, Lincoln said uh, from Burnett House, I think that was Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, Lincoln noted how much more important government institutions were than party identity in securing the rights of men. Such a bipartisan celebration as the inauguration of a president every four years, he remarked, would be impossible without those institutions. I just wanted to read that. Yes. <laughs> Let's go to what, um, I have a feeling I know why. But <laughs> yeah, we all do. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, really the power of the press, which you yeah. have been in. Uh, I'm going to show you a sketch that Adelbert Volk did. This is one of the originals that came. The originals were lost. Mm -hmm. it came from plates back later in the 1880s or 90s that came from those plates. And of course, everyone who knows the Lincoln story knows how he went through Baltimore and uh, the skies, perhaps, but certainly in the dead of night. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Howard was the one who invented the story of Lincoln sulking skulking through Baltimore with a scotch hat. Why did he do that? Well, he later in his career is giving a speech up in upstate New York and he talks about what motivated him. And he says basically when he was, um, you know, I, I don't know how, I, I'll fill in a little just in case somebody who's watching doesn't know the story, but just that, so, you know, he's reporting, they're up in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and they're about to go through Baltimore the next day. And uh, he, uh, Howard's about to, you know, write his story and file for the night. And he's locked into his hotel room by an agent, um, this uh, agent who is t telling him he will not be allowed out until the morning because there has been a threat on the president's life. And so Howard is so indignant at the fact that he has been kept from the story that he starts just writing the story out in order to file the next morning. And he's used to writing with a lot of details at his disposal. And that's part of the charm of his writing, actually, is that he's very good at picking out the very specific things that he sees. And what it's one of the things that made him so popular as a New York reporter. But uh, he just decides he's going to make up the outfit that uh, Lincoln is wearing. And so he, he blatantly said, you know, I, I imagined him in the cloak um, that, uh, you know, a general's cloak and I um, at, put this little hat on his head uh, because I thought it would be, you know, picturesque. And, uh, and so it's this scotch cap um, and cape. And so what happens is people see the story the next morning when he's released and he's able to file and it goes up to New York and it's put in the papers. Uh, they, uh, there's so much uh, ridicule uh, uh, to Lincoln about the fact that he would skulk in in this goofy costume, um, that all the newspapers started changing their stories to include the detail. And then the cartoonists, as you're showing there, uh, went crazy. So there's, there's multiple, I've seen probably eight cartoons that are, are just mocking Abraham Lincoln for this costume. And uh, there is a moment where Lamon, the bodyguard, says that Abraham Lincoln really regretted having done that skulking um, because it set him up to be uh, made fun of, you know, ridiculed. It, it undercut his image as a as a leader at the very beginning of his presidency. Yet at the time, there were real reasons to do that. Yes, Lamon and Norman Judd, who was on the train, and yep. others, uh, Pinkerton. Uh, you know, really forced him to do that because they feared for his life and maybe rightly so. Yes, I but agree. I mean, I there's just showed a couple of artifacts because we, we are an antiquarian shop here at the mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln Bookshop and we have artifacts like this. The train pass you'll see on our website. Uh, the bulk I'll get to, we have the, I have the whole collection of that and I'll get that on the website as well. But there's a link probably to the train pass that Bjorn is putting up. Now, back to this because this to me shows the power of the press, mm -hmm. or at least the power of first impressions or characterizations outliving the truth. Yeah. And the Volt sketch was one. Another was Jeff Davis, his alleged dress when fleeing, my favorite song sheet in the Civil War is Jeff's last shift. Yes. And he had to live out his life 
people thinking that he put on a dress to disguise yes. was really an overcoat from his wife so he would be warm in the woods. Mm -hmm. So as one involved in political and investigative journalism, yeah. speak to the power of the press in being able to be the first to characterize an event and that characterization then sticking through history even till today. Yes, I mean, you see partly too, um, and it's a problem that goes on, which is that in the vacuum, that's when the somebody can strike, you know? So the fact that Lincoln, it, Lincoln did um, go under, you know, go under cover of night for very good reasons. I mean, he really needed for his safety to be, you know, worried that he was going to be harmed on the way. Um, but that absence of him in the public sphere allowed that, you know, story to go out and no one could contradict it because no one had seen him, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't as if another reporter could tell Howard he had gotten it wrong. So I think what you, you know, it becomes interesting how politicians then start to understand they can leave almost no gaps because it's not so much, I mean, Howard's an unusually uh, loose reporter on I would say I mean most reporters would not pull something like that but uh, it shows you how partisanship can definitely fill in a void and um, in, in a negative way and so and it and what's interesting is after Howard does it Abraham Lincoln appears to forgive him um, for it he's invited to the White House uh, he's allowed to be on a special junket uh, when when he uh, goes to have this sort of conference um, with a, a, a retired general. And so, you know, it didn't seem to do any harm directly to Howard's reputation at that moment, but definitely it's, a, it's very disturbing. Actually, I'll tell you one other thing that because you're all Lincoln, big Lincoln fans, I can tell this story, which I find so fascinating. When um, I was in the archives going through Howard's material at Princeton, um, there's uh, a story which I had seen before that was never, I n it never had been credited to Howard, but it said that um, Abraham Lincoln said goodbye to his books the night before he headed to DC. Um, and it was this poetic moment where he goes and he one by one says goodbye to his books. So it turns out Howard wrote that and Howard wrote this well after Abraham Lincoln had died. And uh, so he says in the piece, you know, that it was he who spent that last night, Lincoln was in his hometown uh, saying goodbye to the books. And so what we have then from reality, <laughs> from the record is that uh, when uh, Howard sees him in Cincinnati back in 1861, he says, this is the first time I saw Abraham Lincoln. So we know that if he had, as a young reporter, had the great advantage to spend the last night uh, with Lincoln in Springfield, he certainly would have written about it. So that's another mm. sign of the way Howard will distort things for his own narrative purposes. It's very interesting that one of the earliest clients that I encountered when I came to the shop in 1971, literally he did that every night. He went to his library, he touched some books, oh, really? and said goodnight to them. Wow. And I understand that. Yeah. Most of us bibliophiles <laughs> understand that. Uh, while, we're on, now while I have you as a journalist, we haven't gotten to the meat of this book yet, <laughs> um, but I, I have you as a journalist, I want to ask you this too. Um, give us some insight into how journalism's approach their, journalists approach their stories. You talk about Howard mm -hmm. giving a story from Ball's Bluff. Yeah. And showing what you say, a strain of narcissism, yeah. because he mentioned that his stirrup buckles had been hurting him. Yeah. Uh, from a reader's point of view, uh, does that not give a sense of verisimilitude, oh, uh, of being out in the field, or is it just an inappropriate thing for the journalist to mention? Well, the thing is, it's, I mean, it's interesting because in a way he's a little like Hunter Thompson or something, right? You know, for mm -hmm. his time, I mean, he was bringing, he was bringing the, um, the writer's ego into the story. And that was absolutely amusing. I mean, there's the, his, one of his first stories is he's covering a strike, a shoe maker's strike uh, in Massachusetts. And it's his description of him trying to get into the room that he's not allowed to get into that makes that such riveting reading. So there is definitely a part of that that I think is, you know, I admire because I think it's really uh, entertaining journalism and helps people get like, the feeling that they're there. But it's a little insensitive because, I mean, he, this is in the same article that has a list of the dead, you know? So, so I mean, 
for people who had lost their loved ones, you know, it would be like, you know, now during COVID, someone making a big deal about getting the test done, you know, but mm -hmm. and then having a list of the people who died, you just, it's just absolutely inappropriate in that circumstance. So I think it's interesting to see his character leaking out in some of his articles and you can start to get a sense of this, this character. Well, okay. I talked about the meat of the book. Let's get into that. Mm -hmm. Can you give me, our viewers, the mm -hmm. elevator thought on an overview of what this hoax was? Who mm -hmm. was, who was Joseph Howard? We're getting a sense of him, Joseph Howard Jr. Uh, why did some of the papers fall for it? We'll get into that, but most did not. Uh, and how did the authorities find him? Did it know that it was Howard? But give us a sense of what, what was this hoax? Okay, so basically what happened was in May 1864, uh, in the early hours of, uh, of the morning, you know, three in the morning, uh, a young boy is running through the streets of New York near Newspaper Row, uh, and he's got a proclamation in his hands. And now Abraham Lincoln had been, you know, sometimes was teased in the press for how often he was issuing proclamations. Uh, and it, basically when newspapers got them, they had to run them almost directly because they're, they shouldn't censor the president in any way. So they, uh, so he goes to the different newspaper offices. Most of them are basically closed, but he finds two where there's a printer, you know, running the presses and, uh, and they take a look at these documents and realize this is right from the president. It's, you know, has uh, the Secretary of War is also on, uh, Secretary of State is also on here. And it's calling for 400,000 new uh, soldiers to go to the front where he will have to immediately institute a draft. And he's talking about the fact that all of these events, these um, battles that have recently been waged have been a terrible disaster and we have to, you know, pray for forgiveness from, you know, uh, for, because so, for some reason uh, the U.S. has been, you know, decided to be the monumental sufferer of the century. So uh, when the news breaks the next morning, you know, the stock market, particularly the gold market, goes into fluctuations. Um, people are gathering on the street. It's a very tense moment because the draft riots had been the year before. And so this is a lot of tension that, you know, could be unleashed in the, in New York and then have ripple effects uh, further. But on top of it, there's a, a ship that's about to go overseas to Europe. And if it carries this news, uh, this may very well influence how France and England view the United States and whether to just out, out and out recognize the Confederacy as a separate country. So there is a tremendous amount at stake. Lincoln uh, gets word of this. He immediately shuts down the telegraph office in uh, DC and he puts out an order later in the day saying that he wants the arrest of all the newspaper editors who are involved and military put in those newspaper offices to seize the presses. And this becomes a constitutional crisis. So. It was that issue that got me interested <laughs> as mm -hmm. I began the investigation. The twists and turns of it are so remarkable in terms of sometimes you think one person's guilty and then it turns out it's somebody else and there's all these complexities that take you through a full, you know, sort of panorama of the Civil War period that I felt it was very worthy uh, as a story to tell. And uh, you say that the other newspapers were closed you think they would have ran it if they had been open? Well, they were, some of them had, some of them, you know, I'm, that's, that's doing a kind of composite, but um, I mean, they all had different stories. You know, one had um, somebody on hand who, who took a look at it and sent a runner to the Associated Press to check on its veracity, uh, was told it's false as hell, and then just kind of kept that news almost to themselves, um, so didn't let the other newspaper, uh, newspapers know that. Um, others, uh, yeah, one was just closed, didn't get it. Uh, it was a variety, but all all of the newspapers that were part of the Associated Press got the got the proc where they tried to deliver the proclamation. Uh, I want to get to the motive yes. and uh, the crux of this as well uh, is that Lincoln did have in his back pocket a proclamation that he was thinking about, and I want to get to that uh, very quickly after this. Bjorn, you might have something to ask right now. 
Uh, yeah, I do, and because we have a question that came in from one of our uh, customers. Uh, but boy, we're right in the middle of the good part <laughs> of, the, <laughs> of the good. Part. But so I'm going to distract you, Elizabeth, just a moment because I want to I want to answer a customer's question, and we'll get back into the good part. Uh, but Brian from uh, Michigan, who's a good customer of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, uh, it occurred to him, uh, and so he asked a question. Uh, he wants to know, do we know what Lincoln actually wore on the trip from Baltimore to Washington? Uh, yes, actually, the, it, apparently he wore a wool hat that a friend of his gave him in New York City. And then the cape was just his one that he owned. It wasn't some grand military cloak. Um, so, yeah, we do know. Okay. <laughs> sadly, he got, and sadly, he got that terrible, I mean, the, and the hat wasn't even one that was so unusual. It was given to, it was fairly new to him because he had just received it as a gift, but it wasn't a very unusual hat. It was just what anyone might wear. Right, right. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, we, we do have another question, and, uh, uh, but that's just, an, uh, it's one of our uh, customers sent me an email directly and wanted to talk about Clement Vlandingham. And uh, I have a feeling, Jim, that we're going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> Clement Vallandigan at some point. But right now, uh, uh, Dan and Elizabeth are on a roll talking about this, this fake news, this fake proclamation. So I'm going to duck out and come back if we get any more, uh, any more questions from customers. So uh, what, was, um, uh, what was his motive to put this fake mm -hmm. proclamation Oh, before we get to the next step in the book. Yes. Well, I mean, this is part of the mystery because he gave so many different alibis. I, I mean, first, one thing that's very interesting is when they actually, you know, tracked him down. Uh, uh, he, and you have to understand, this is like the most, one of the most famous journalists of the moment, you know? So it, it's a very unusual situation that it's, it, that it comes down to that this person decided to risk everything you know, to, to put out this proclamation. So at first he acts just absolutely flabbergasted. And so, and, and all the accounts make that very clear. It wasn't just the usual, you know, I'm faking it because I'm being accused of something and I'm trying to get out of it. It seemed that he was absolutely bewildered at the fact that he was being arrested. Then as he's taken, you know, back into Manhattan uh, to be essentially processed and then to be put on a boat to go out to Fort Lafayette, which was the um, prison for, you know, Confederate spies and, you know, all sorts of ne'er-do-wells <laughs> for the, in the Union side's opinion. Um, uh, he, he shifts around. At one point he says, well, I, he was doing it to make money on the gold market. So the idea that the news was going to, you know, sort of goose the markets and he would, having bought gold the day before, would then make a killing right at that moment. And then uh, he starts to, as he's headed out, he's being accompanied by this um, one uh, military officer who had had a career as a humorist and a, a journalist uh, uh, in New York. And so he starts to shift the story and says, actually, it was a joke. I just meant the entire thing as a joke. But when you examine the proclamation, it bears none of the markings of any of the kind of humor pieces of that time. I mean, there's no funny names, there's no little twists that make you understand it to be satire. It's, it's a very serious proclamation. It actually reads a lot. Uh, people said, uh, one of the editors, I think it was the New York Times said, um, you know, any, you know, essentially any idiot would have been able to understand that that was not Lincoln's work, but actually it resembles a lot of the proclamations that came out from Lincoln, you know, the ones that are more less well known than you know the ones that changed history entirely but is it your view that uh as an investigative reporter and you have views in here yeah um that it was the gold market that perhaps was the real motive money i do think money was the real motive i also, I'm not completely convinced that it was, uh, you know, Howard trying to make money just on his own, because there's um, reports of him having talked about getting the document, 
uh, in advance, maybe, you know, it's, it's something like a, 11 days before the incident, he was seen talking about this proclamation and showing a copy of it. And it, the way it's discussed, it makes me think, actually, he's talking about it much more like the way a reporter would talk about getting a scoop. You know, it doesn't have that kind of, what do you think? Do you think this, this is, uh, uh, you know, believable or what have you? He was very confident and everyone made note of that, that he had this tremendous confidence. And so it makes me one, you know, it makes me think perhaps he had word, you know, that Lincoln, what we know to be true now, because we can see the archives, is that Abraham Lincoln on that exact same day hand wrote a proclamation calling for 300,000 more troops, signed it, but did not send it out. And so, uh, so it does seem as if it's more at the level of a scoop. Well, uh, exactly. And that's the next crux of this story. And that uh, Lincoln did have a proclamation, but he got overly angry, more yeah. than one expects him to be. Yeah. And uh, you play on that throughout this book. Yeah. Uh, and you certainly say that Frank Fowler's memorandum, which is here in a typescript at Chicago History yeah. Museum uh, as part of the uh, John Gunther collection. Yes. Uh, John Gunther also had, I don't know if you've seen it, but the memorandum, but he also had the skin from the snake from the Garden of Eden. It's right here in Chicago. <laughs> really? We collected that. It's here. <laughs> That's funny. And, um, but the original copy of the proclamation, one of those proclamations that was being handed out that day, yes, by Howard, one of his, is here as well, yes. uh, I understand. But is that anger reasonable to some extent? Um, he's a human. He's certainly, as many presidents have been, unhappy when they don't have a chance to put out something that's so volatile as... 400,000 more troops yes. to be needed. We already had draft riots. Yeah. And he certainly wanted to prepare the nation. And it yeah. could be more rioting if it had been scooped. And he should have been angry about that. What is your oh, thought yeah. about that? Oh, I absolutely agree. But I actually, but what I become interested in is um, that his first actions in that anger are to check the War Department to see if a um, telegram went over the wires that way. And his second thing is to go send his favorite telegraph officer over to shut down the DC one. So what that says is, I, it, to me, <laughs> he's not saying, you know, these journalists made this thing up out of thin air. He's saying who got it to them, you know? And so it becomes his anger at a leak from the White House. I mean, the, the, um, and so, exactly. yeah, so I think that that's fascinating because the, the, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I become, I'm, I'm fully, um, I fully endorse his anger. It makes absolute sense because of the fact that, you know, I mean, the, first of all, the draft riots in New York are sort of underplayed, I think on a certain level, and maybe were mm -hmm. distorted because of gangs of New York, which made it look like it was just, you know, almost like, violent but almost madcap white gangs but it's i mean it was horrible there were there were you know many many black people who were lynched on the streets of new york and the accounts that i've come across and the you know uh are just absolutely horrific and so the so the idea that that could erupt again was a terrible thing and then also you know it was it they would be aware that there was a ship going over to Europe as well. So I just think what I become interested in is his uh, his worries about where that information came from. And is he dealing with somebody who's trying to undercut him from the most intimate confines of the White House? Well, I, I can't think of a president, maybe accepting Millard Fillmore, who has not been unhappy with someone undercutting a yeah. piece of news LBJ, for heaven's sakes, was going to fire Hoover. It got out, and he decided not to. Yeah. You're not going to scoop me. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So that's how presidents go ahead. Now, the next part of this story, though, is a little more important, perhaps, than just a president's peak. Yeah. That is the constitutionality of some of his actions. Yes. And we all know, 
all of us in the Lincoln world uh, know we're, we're Lincoln obsessives here. Spielberg gave us that moniker, yeah. and he's correct. We are. Uh, and as you write, Lincoln's view was that constitutional rights would need to be sacrificed to save the nation. So we talk, of course, about habeas corpus, Clement Philandingham, newspapers shut and censored, journalists temporarily jailed. Howard, by the way, was jailed with some of Mosby's Rangers. But yeah. that was an interesting thing I didn't know about. So um, I, I had a, a question here because there's a, in regard to this, uh -huh. there is a one sentence that leapt out at me from this whole entire book. And that is on page 118, uh -huh. Lincoln could be predicted to overreact to the hoax, demonstrating the president's fragile commitment to constitutional rights. Now that's hard for us obsessive to swallow whole. Uh -huh. And first of all, I wanna ask about the first part of the sentence, that he's, it's predictable that he would overreact. That's not the Lincoln most of us know. Mm -hmm. well, Why the do you thing, believe that? Well, okay, the one, when I was doing this research, I mean, first of all, the reason I was interested in the research was because of my impressions of Abraham Lincoln beforehand, and then, he, you know, knowing that he went and sent in the military to these newspaper offices, etc. Now, um, I, we can, I can absolutely understand his anger, but then you also have to think, okay, if he thought it was a leak, if he was under the impression it was a leak, why would it immediately going, go to arresting the newspapers? It'd be like when the Pentagon papers, them sending military into the Washington Post, you know, it's just like, mm -hmm. it doesn't really um, add up as a response of a leader who is extremely interested in the constitution. So I, then I was surprised when I was doing the research that as he's taking office, he, um, he, you know, through his war department, but he, he, he asks for the entire, um, uh, you know, uh, the entire collection of telegrams in New York for the year preceding. I mean, that's a pretty extraordinary, um, that's a wide net, let's say, uh, in the search for the, the, you know, conspiracies you might fear. I mean, to take what the Telegraph at that time was almost like our internet in as much as I, you know, I was coming across people changing their, you know, their from dinner to the opera in one day, you know, by Telegram, because those messages were going out constantly. There was a, um, it was ubiquitous and everybody was using it. And so to, 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 with, without a whole lot of, um, parsing through why you would take the whole net of them. I thought that was a pretty extreme um, uh, gesture. And then, you know, and then the habeas corpus, which I'm sure you've talked about on here quite a bit. I mean, it's just interesting how many times that's legally challenged and, it, you know, in the Congress is challenged as an idea because it was generally thought um, if you were going to um, sus suspend habeas corpus, it would be, uh, only in areas where bullets were flying, but they kept getting broader and broader in terms of where it was going to be suspended. And the right to a, a trial is a you know major tenant of our uh, democracy. So, uh, and he then has letters where he says, you know, I I would uh, it would be terrible to let other laws um, be violated uh, just to allow you know these to stand. Um, so he was he was he very he knew it was a letter he wrote to a bunch of Democrats knowing it was going to be leaked. So he took a pretty strong stand that he was flexible in thinking about what, how, how to uphold the constitution. So I think that uh, it is, yeah, it was, there was enough of a track record, let's say, um, uh, to, to say that, that that might be the way he would go. He had a great moral sense and he had a great sense of, um, you know, sort of the dignity of, of mankind, but I think that there were some issues that he had some, he was a little shaky on. <laughs> Mary Lincoln. Yes. All right. So in general, the story is, is known of the hoax, although you've brought out a lot of material that maybe we really don't know or have not 
paid much attention to. Uh, but, you know, is Mary, one of the things is, what, why, did, why do you believe Mary was behind it? Is it inference? Do you have a smoking gun? Uh, he, Lincoln, in another story, I'm going to bring two of them together, um, went before Congress. Jo, uh, Carl Sandburg wrote this very movingly, how he went in before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, hat in hand, and swore that they were in a secret meeting in the morning that usually he didn't do, that his wife, that there was no traitor in the White House, even though Emily uh, Helm was there, and they may have, that's one of the reasons that may have sparked this, but nonetheless, both those stories kind of conflate a bit because Mary's in the background. And so uh, you say that Lincoln was covering up the truth by separating the leak from treason. Maybe you can speak to that. Okay. Because I don't think Abraham thought that Mary was being treasonous. Well, no, I think that, I think that, uh, so when it becomes an investigation, they are, they are thinking it's treasonous that the state of the union, in what is now called the state of the union was leaked. Um, and uh, he, and I find it, I found it very exciting <laughs> too, because you know, that story of him going hat in hand, um, then there has been a whole examination. They say, oh, that's apocryphal because, you know, A, he, you know, they didn't have morning meetings. They didn't do that. But then I went back and found the actual newspaper account of him going to the, you know, appearing on the Hill um, just those five days before his son died. So it's right in that pocket. And he says that, you know, he doesn't know of his family having treason, treasonous activity. Now, the thing is that in the quote, even the original one that we've heard, he says, as, as um, to my knowledge, okay, number one. And he says, no member of my family was involved in treasonous activity. Now, I think that that allows a whole lot of room for her possibly to have leaked that document, but he's saying, it's not about treason. This is not, there's no reason to investigate her because this is not anything that is going to cause the downfall of the nation. And so, uh, and there's enough evidence that she was involved because there's all sorts of witnesses who are, you know, testifying to her, um, you know, having moved this information around within the White House. And she's in the most tragic situation in the world, which is her son is dying. I mean, so the, her husband going and making that plea, I think, is right in the realm of saying, you know what, you're, you're just trying to do this investigation for, for no benefit to the country. It's only going to cause harm to this person. So, so, there's, so that's one incident of the, um, you know, poss her possibly leaking. But in this case with the fake news, we have Sunset Cox writing to Manton Marble and saying the, the proclamation that you're, the, Manton Marble was one of the editors who got in trouble just to give the background. Um, he was the editor at the world, but it, it says, he says, um, the proclamation that you are, you know, now that got essentially that got you into trouble is based on fact. And it may have come from Mary Todd Lincoln. So that's the first whiff of, you know, this is possibly her. Um, the other thing is, uh, that, that there, we know the information got up to New York. It got to Howard. We have another account in that, um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, the um, brigade, the, the one about the Civil War journalists, um, that Joseph Howard was a close confidant of Mary Todd Lincoln's. We also have the fact that Mary Todd Lincoln had um, just a couple of weeks before this written a letter to one of her biggest creditors, um, a, a department you know, in New York, um, she was known to have this shopping mania, and she had a debt that was about $26,000, and she wrote saying she was going to settle that debt by June 1st, which, you know, this incident is May 18th, and, and June 1st, to come up with that kind of money, which was more than her husband's salary for the year in a matter of weeks, suggests that there was some strategy she had in mind. She had come up to- maybe, maybe it could have been for her, the money. Oh, yes. That's why she- yes. was I, that's my belief. And there's, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, we know that she was distraught about her debts at that moment in time. 
Um, she, she confessed this to Elizabeth Keckley and he, she was really worried saying, you know, that the debts could be used against her and also that her husband, if he lost the election, she, she, they would come out. And she was so worried about how he would view her if uh, he knew of the level of debt she was in. Uh, Bjorn, if you don't mind, I'd like to go with a couple more questions, if I may, even though we're going to go over the hour. If oh, that makes okay sense to me, if it's okay with you, Elizabeth. Yeah, that's fine. All, All right. right, well, let's, that, let's, that do, uh, up, put me let's do what here. they call extra time in soccer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Penalty kicks, yeah. A couple of things I wanted to talk about uh, are various things. So, first of all, Mary, I have a very empathetic view of Mary, and uh, it, it, it hurts me to know that there are other parts of her that might not be what I would like to see her, her involved in. But this is, this is, I have a very empathetic view too of her. And I, I mean, I think she's clearly, she was brilliant. She often knew the truth about the people surrounding her husband, but she had a mania and it's, I mean, it was perhaps, you know, connected to depression that we know that she suffered, et cetera. So um, yes, yeah, I think these two things are possible. She could have, yeah. you know, that she could have done it and she's also suffering. Yeah, and her character could not handle, I think, throughout life, what life sent her. Yes. The three kids killed her mom, dying early on. Her husband, for heaven's sakes, shot right next to her, and et cetera. So I, I think the, part of that mania may have been, I'm a son of a psychoanalyst, so without having her on a couch, I yeah. can't really delve into what that mania came from. But it, it's, it's from very various aspects. Um, one of the things I just want to, here's something uh, out of left field. Mm -hmm. The Telegraph, you write, the Telegraph didn't bring Americans closer, but seemed to reveal its fissures. Sounds very modern. It does, doesn't it? I mean, something I thought like, that... uh, We have social yeah. media today that was supposed to bring us together, but... I know. I thought that was amazing because, you know, it's one of those things too, you come across that and you think, oh, that's just me reading into the similarities. But then when you have Samuel Morse actually trying to create a society to reunify the country, you know, the inventor of the telegraph realizes how problematic it is. I thought that was just fascinating. And so actually it was very interesting to me to see how um, people started to mature and be educated in how to deal with this technology and the ways in which it could be misused. And even now, you know, I think that we've done a lot better than we did four years ago um, in terms of tracking these things and hopefully we'll get even better. But it was very interesting to see that this was that, that version. Was new. Of, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go into this right now, um, but uh, you bring up the Rebecca letters Yes. We, all of us in the Lincoln world know about that. Uh, you who don't, Google it. Um, <laughs> and of course, the Lincoln, uh, Lincoln buying a German newspaper, uh, mm -hmm. which he couldn't read German, but he wanted to reach out to the German voters who were so important to him. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he secretly did that and kept that really a secret and, and diverted you. It's interesting that you say you write that diversion tended yeah. to be a favorite tactic of Lincoln's for getting a difficult, through a difficult conversation. Yeah. So he certainly diverted when it came to the German newspaper that he owned and going forward from it as well. But, you know, is that, again, that left me mm -hmm. possibly thinking you were thinking that this is a trait of, of Lincoln that he was trying to be secretive and manipulative in some fashion. And I, it might be, mm -hmm. but I, it's not the Lincoln I, I have come to know over 49 years mm -hmm. and I'm ready to learn, but yes. it seems that's not him to me. Mm -hmm. To me, it's also perhaps the private nature of the man. Mm -hmm. um, his personality was to be private. His friends during, after his life, all said they may have had him surrounded. They didn't know the real Lincoln. They didn't yeah. know the crux of the man. He was private. And this could have been something besides maybe being somewhat scandalous, although there was a lot of interconnectivity between journalists, papers, and politicians. And this was not something new. 
Uh, and people of the day would not have thought that too scandalous, but maybe he thought that. But I think it was the private nature of the man. But the Please. only thing I thought from Tell that, though, that. the only thing I thought from that, though, because I've had the, you know, you know, good fortune or, you know, interesting life or what have you to be involved in a lot of circles, you know, be through magazine work and all the rest. And so I've come across a lot of people, you know, some of whom are well known. And I think that the only, I, when I read that, having read so much about him in preparation for um, writing this book, I actually thought that's not privacy necessarily. <laughs> that's a, that's a, um, that's a complexity of character that makes someone unknowable, even though you've spent a tremendous amount of time with him. And so, um, and even the way he goes and hangs out at the, with the telegraph officers, I thought that was really interesting too, because they loved him very much, right? But that was a, um, you know, half of the time that he's there, he's just, he likes it because he can be himself and he doesn't have to put on any kind of show. But the other half, he's reading everything that's coming across the wires and, you know, sort of monitoring it, which is half great, right? Because you want a president who is involved in knowing all of the details of, um, of being an administrator and a leader. But on the other hand, it also is there's something, there's some other characteristic to that. I thought that some of the things that he did, I think, I mean, overall, I do believe that he's a very, he was a very moral person and it was an extraordinary amount of courage to decide, you know, enough is enough and I'm going to um, take the risk of my life to, to get this country on track to be more of what it's supposed to be. But I think some of his actions, if I were a reporter, and learned of them then, I would have been worried. I think that the buying the secret newspaper is a worrisome thing because he, the contract is they can't say anything against the, the uh, platform. And I know there was partisanship then, but most of that was very overt. You know, you had, you know, Henry Raymond basically leading the Republican Party at one point, and he's, he's the head of the Times. That was no secret what you were getting, but that is secret if you have a, a contract. I thought that his writing, you know, I don't think he did all the Rebecca letters, but I think he did the first one because the banking, you know, obsession was not Mary Todd Lincoln's work. And so writing a critique of someone you're facing, you know, uh, you know a, a political opponent essentially, um, under a false name is a little troubling. So was I just troubling think, then or just today? I would think it would be troubling no matter when you were mm -hmm. operating. I mean, you know, uh, it certainly was troubling to the person who he was <laughs> satirizing or what have you, because he accused him, you know, challenged him to a duel. Um, yeah. And I think that having, um, you know, having your people in the White House or on the campaign are going to the inaugural filing stories, you know, under false, either pseudonyms or anonymous, you know, bylines. That's also a little bit concerning. It makes me, I don't think he did those things by accident, let's say. I think that those, I think he knew what he wanted to accomplish and so let those things occur. Well, um, then do you think that knowing this, now I'm, I'm happy to see Mr. Lincoln as a mortal, yeah, as a human being. Exactly. Yeah. Because at the same time, it makes him to me more of a hero. Yes. Uh, yeah. And because a human being like him, thankfully we had him and whom he was and a wonderful exemplar for him, for us today, for yes. kids, for us as adults. So, uh, but I don't mind him being a complex pe person. I think we need to, and you brought something out here that maybe we have to start uh, chewing over a little bit more. Hard to do that when we don't have them on that couch. Yeah, but let's say this too, is that I think there's something healthy about, okay, Abraham Lincoln clearly was necessary for this country to, to be you know, able to go forward and hopefully be the greatest country <laughs> that's ever been, uh, seen. But uh, 
if we only thought of him without that complexity, it makes us never get able to have another Lincoln because people would think I can never possibly be as perfect as that human being was. So it's actually, mm -hmm. I think that showing some of these complexities is good. And the other thing is like when talking to somebody else, I was thinking, you know, why can't our country be like that the country is heroic, you know what I mean? That it's amazing that this group of people who fight over everything and, you know, there's media holding the president to task and the president's doing things that, you know, a lawyer has to take, you know, bring to task. I think that that's, um, that's where the heroism can lie, you know, and we can point out what extraordinary things Abraham Lincoln did, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this, you know, this perfect, uh, un, you know, untainted. Oh, well, sure. Then, then here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, we're really uh, high priests at the altar, as I yeah. once said before. And I don't want to be that. And I do look for flaws, and I appreciate your bringing one out. Well, and here's the other thing, uh, because my friend Ted Widmer and I were discussing this, is that, you know, we always were wondering, how does it, you know, how do people devote their whole lives to writing about Abraham Lincoln? And then when we started writing about him, we realized we could easily do it because it's his complexity that makes him so fascinating. I mean, that's why, you know, having 5,000 books about him is well worth it because there's so many ways to look at him and, you know, different parts of his life to examine. So I Actually, think it's- Actually, uh, three or four times that number. Yeah, we I think know. About 16, 17,000. <laughs> so can we, can we still keep him up as number one on most lists? Oh, yes. yes. Okay, phew. Yes. Yes. I feel better. Yes. Bjorn, I mean, you're back on. Elizabeth, thank you so much. This was fun. I'd I like to continue it. this because I had more to talk about. There are many stories in here. And I think all of us in the Lincoln world should devour this book because you're going to see that complexity and we should grapple with it as well as people who love Mr. Lincoln. So thank you, Elizabeth, so thank much for writing so much. it and being with us. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations, Elizabeth, on, on scoring your penalty kick. <laughs> thank right you. in there. Thank you. Did very well. And, uh, and thank you for joining us on A House Divided. I'm gonna quickly tell the folks at home uh, about some upcoming, um, some upcoming shows. But first, Elizabeth, I wanna give you some good news. I hope you take uh, mm -hmm. us promoting someone else's book is good news. Uh, the Smithsonian Magazine today uh, released their 10 best history books of 2020. Now that's all history, not just Lincoln and Civil War. And two of the authors that appear on this show made the Smithsonian's top oh, 10 list great. of best books in uh, history in 2020. I'll yeah. add to that that for the first five years that we did this, we picked the Lincoln Prize winner every time. Wow. The publisher wouldn't send a, an author to us that was the first time we ever failed to nail the, uh, you know, get down the Lincoln Prize winner. We're, so we're pretty much the uh, 538, Nate Silver 538 <laughs> of prize winners. So when Lincoln Lincoln's lie goes to, goes up for prizes. <laughs> Thank you. You've been on the right, you've been on the right show. Thank By you. By the way, uh, Bjorn, Ron Chernow was on with his Washington book two weeks before he got the Pulitzer. Wow. Exactly. So yeah, that have been White, awesome. uh, right before he got his Pulitzer Prize for the uh, Frederick Douglass that's book. Great. So uh, that's, it's reason to be hopeful for when yeah, it gets, gets to the juries. Gets to the jury. <laughs> thank hey, you. I want to tell everybody at home about upcoming events. And we're starting the 2021, we're starting to schedule our 2021 season for uh, A House Divided. And the first book that we have actually booked is Benjamin T. Arrington, The Last Lincoln Republican. Uh, it's his book on the presidential election of 1880. And that is, of course, Garfield versus Winfield Scott Hancock. Also coming up in 2021, we don't have him to show you, uh, don't have him up on the website yet, but uh, Karen Cox will join us with No Common Ground, her upcoming book about the Confederate monuments uh, controversy of 2020 of the of recently and uh, I know I know Daniel will really enjoy having doing that interview um, and then uh, a lot of other a lot of other great books are coming out in 2021 as you said before 2020 was a great year for Lincoln books and I think 2021 is going to continue in that so for everyone so to everyone at home from everyone here at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop 
Thank you for your uh, patience with our technical issues. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your patience with the technical issues and for staying a little bit long. Oh, and uh, we will see you next time on House Divided. <laughs>